All right, folks. Well, welcome back to a new episode of, uh, well, this is not Chuck's a cooking. This is Chuck's a brewing. And if you look over here, over my, my left hand uh, shoulder, your right, as you're looking at the screen, you'll see that I have a brewery set up. And so we are going to brew some beer today. This is my first brewing experience in 20 years. I used to be quite a prolific home brewer, but I got married and had kids and other priorities kind of took over and so there went the brewing. At any rate, so I have rebuilt a new brewery here. That's what I, one of the things I've been doing this summer. I also just needed to take a break from the YouTube thing here because it's really a lot of work putting on one of these shows. And occasionally I just need to take a break. Also, summertime, I don't feel like doing a lot of cooking simply because of the heat and everything. I've been working doing heating and air conditioning work this summer. And when you spend all day out in the heat, the last thing you wanna do is come in and work and you know, you're all sweaty and everything. And it's just more work than I feel like doing it in the summertime. So at any rate, we're back. And I'm gonna show you how we're gonna go about brewing some beer today. So let's get turned around and follow along. All right, folks, so what I've got set up here is actually a pretty complicated brewery system. Now, I'll kind of explain to you the various parts here. First of all, I've got two burners here to heat up our water and our wort as it will become. Up here, I've got a, up here, yes, I do. Up here, I've got a cooler, a 10 gallon um, igloo cooler that I'm going to hear very shortly, pump some boiling hot water into, and I'll use that as my sparge water. And then here in this, this kettle will be my mash tun, and that is where we are going to cook our grains, kind of similar to how you might cook, um, let's say, oatmeal, except we're not gonna take it to a boil in the mash tun, or our louder tune, I'm sorry, louder tune. And then down here is our actual brew kettle. This is where we are gonna take things to a boil, but our grains will not go with it. It will simply be uh, what we call wort at that point. Wort is kind of like, unferm it is actually unfermented beer. And that is where the hops will be added to the beer right here. Okay, so the first thing I need to do, I have got about five gallons of water in this brew kettle that I'm going to heat to boil and I'm going to pump it up here into the hot liquor tank is what we'll call it. And the hot liquor tank usually means that it is water that has been treated to a, to meet a specific type of um, parameters such as hardness and things like that. Various beer styles come from various parts in the world where the water is not the same as we have here in Anderson, Indiana. And so sometimes you will add things like uh, calcium or even sodium salt, um, sometimes uh, Epsom salt, which is magnesium. And you do that to match the brew, st the beer style, the water, because we'll, let's face it, beer is somewhere usually between 90 and 95% water. Now you hear a lot of people in other videos that might tell you that it's 98% water. Well, that, how can it be 98% water if you're making a 6% alcohol beer? Doesn't make much sense, does it? So this is gonna be a new series of brewing and I'm kind of taking you into a deep step here. And then as we go along, we're gonna move backwards and I'm gonna take you back to the most simplest form of brewing, which will be brewing an extract brew on top of the stove. And then we'll work our way forward back up to here throughout the series. So this is a rooster, but this <laughs> is going to be an overview of how you brew beer. And we're gonna take a, you can stop anytime. And so <laughs> let's get turned around. We'll see what we're going with this. All right, so in regards to our water, I'll get this out of the way real quick here. You see the white hose. And if you follow that back, 
two, past the flowers, you come right here. This is a charcoal filter. And that charcoal filter removes the chlorine and whatnot out of the water. Not the dissolved solids, but it will remove the chlorine out of the water. Now that hose came up a little short, so I had to manually transfer the water from the end of this white hose up to my louder tune and also into my brew kettle, which has already been done. So I just wanted to point that out to you. That's a very important thing. Water is a very important ingredient in beer, as just as important as any of the other ingredients that I'll go through here in a little bit. Now then, here is our malt. And this malt, you can see if you look real close, has been ground. And the purpose is to separate the holes from the interior pieces of the kernels. Because it's the interior pieces of the kernels that we are going to use here in a moment, we are going to convert the starches in the interior pieces of the kernel into sugar, which is fermentable by yeast. And we're going to do that up here in the louder tune. And we're going to do that in this particular case. I want a wort that is moderately fermentable. We want to leave some residual sweetness into it because we're making an ESB, which is a very balanced beer, balanced between the sweetness and the hops, which provides the bitterness for the beer. So here in a little bit, we're going to heat our strike water is what it's called to a, about 167 degrees, I think maybe 165 in that neighborhood. And we want to end up with 154 degrees after I've put in the cool grains into it to bring it down. And then we will hold it there for about an hour while it does the conversion of the starches using beta and alpha amylase to do the conversion. And then we will sparge it out into the brew kettle, which it'll be just liquid then, until we add our yeast. Now those in those packages are hot pellets. And if you've ever fed rabbits or maybe uh, guinea pigs and you've seen the food pellets, those look very similar, except they're made out of hops and they will go into the brew kettle. I'll kind of narrate things as I go along here. Okay, so one thing I want to mention to you is about cleanliness in beer making wine making, any type of food-like process, cleanliness is very important. Now then, there's cleanliness, there's sanitized, and then there's sterilized. We're not gonna worry about sterilized because sterilization is way more than what you need to make beer. However, cleanliness, things need to be scrubbed and cleaned, just like you were cleaning your plates at, for dinner. And Everything down to this point right here has to be cleaned. When we take our beer further down, everything has to be sanitized. And sanitized is using a chemical of some sort to kill all 90%, 99% of the microbes that might touch the beer. Because everything down to here is going to go through a, six, a 75 minute boil in this particular case. A lot of people will do 60 minutes, but I'm going to do 75 today. And that will kill anything that will come into contact with, or is even in the beer, including in the hops. When I put it in there, the hops came from, you know, the field somewhere where they grew them. And so they have all kinds of living uh, microorganisms in there that if you just put them in there, they could cause issues at an early stage in the beer. Now you can dry hop beers later after they've already fermented and they've got, and it's got alcohol in it and you can do that, but we'll get to those issues later.
All right, folks, well, we are up to a good rolling boil about 40 minutes later, maybe 30 minutes later. I didn't really time that. But at any rate, we're gonna turn our gas off now. I'm gonna connect my, this is um, food grade. Um, yes, it is. Food grade piping there. Silicone, silicone tubing is what it is. I couldn't get that one spit out. At any rate, it is silicone, food grade silicone, and it can handle the heat here. Now then, get my battery over here. Now, and I made six gallons of this water. Well, I actually need about three. But I'm one of those people that I'd rather have more than enough. And so this is a marine pump, which I scavenged off of my sink system. And you can find a link to how I built that sink system up in the top right hand corner. And we are gonna pump all this hot water right on up to the cooler up above. Way on up there. Got a little bit of a leak right there. I don't know where from. All right, so we've run dry now. I can shut this off. Our next goal, I don't know if you can hear that, but it is raining. Our next goal is to get this our louder tune up to 166 degrees is what the cal online calculator just told me. So I will switch regulators on the gas here. Now then, we're looking for 166 degrees. That way when I put the grains, based upon the weight of the grains and the temperature of the grains, mix it into water in here. And when I mix that in, it should come down to right at 154. What we're looking for and we want to hold that 154 for one hour okay so next thing i need to do here is find my thermometer and see where we're at it seems my dial thermometer is running a few degrees warm 163 64 65 okay so we're within a half a degree i'm good with that i can take it up here in just a minute so now then, we're going to do what's called mashing in. So we're going to take our grains and we are going to slowly mash, mix them into this hot water. And we don't want any grain balls to form. So we kind of stir as we go. Now the 154 that we're looking for as an end temperature here is going to should provide us a some residual sweetness that i told you if it was a lot if it was a lower temperature that we were mashing in at it would make a thinner more fermentable beer or if it were a higher temperature than this it would make a thicker or heavier less fermentable beer with more residual sugars in it and it just depends on what kind of beer you're making as to where you want to go with that these grains are malt actually it's all malt but there are several different colors in this grain here and that is determined by how long they are roasted just like coffee beans the longer they're roasted the more color they're going to put into our finished product here and i want something that's kind of a golden amber type of a or a dark gold to amp amber Color DSB here. As soon as I get this bucket out of my hand, like that, and get this stirred in, I'll be taking another temperature reading. And we want that 154. You can see I got a couple dough balls here that we want to break up. That right there. These dough balls, if you leave them, they will not allow the liquid into them to get a full conversion using the enzymes that are contained within the malt so it's self-converting at specific temperatures and the different enzymes work there's the beta amylase and the alpha amylase they work at different temperatures now, this is the first time i've done in my life what is called an infusion mash previously i had always done what's called step mashing 
where I took it to three different temperature steps. This is going to be a single, a single temperature step. I'm going to get these dough balls broken up. Go ahead and take a temperature reading, see where we're at. I'm a little low to appear. Well, 152, 152.4. So yes, I am a little low. So I'm going to put a little more heat to this to get me up to the 154. Whoa, that was not what I wanted at all. I got a table right there I can use for that. So I will come around to this side where I can get a hold of my heat source if I need it. Because it shouldn't take long to get me up to this 154. And I may, over the course of the hour, I may have to put, in fact, there we are right there. Over the course of the hour, I may have to put heat to this a couple times. Okay. So over the course of the hour, I'm going to be trying to maintain this 154 and stirring occasionally. Okay, so you see what it look, looks like down in here. There's our grains. Looks a whole lot like oatmeal maybe, although it is all barley. You can put oats, wheat, rye, and other grains into a beer. Budweiser uses rice and corn, and that's how they make their beer so light. Okay, you can see we got all the lumps pretty well broken up here. So once again, I'm going to be monitoring the temperature, letting the uh, enzymes work on this stuff, on this uh, mash is what it's called here at this point. Putting a little heat to it occasionally if I need it, as well as a stir. 153 right there. So we're within one degree. I'm pretty happy with that. We'll be back in a little bit when it's time to move on. Okay, so I suppose maybe you can hear the rain hitting the top of the canopy here. Now in our hour has come and gone. And we are going to do what's called a conversion test. And so I need a drop or two or a few drops of this uh, mash liquid here. I'm going to put it into our little bowl. And so this is going to tell us in just a moment, as soon as I get my iodine from down below here, If I put the iodine in, this will drop. There you go. Now in. If the iodine doesn't change color, like that, you can see a little drop of iodine right there. Come on, dropper. There you go. Over here to the edge. It stayed red. That indicates that we converted all of our starches into sugar and so that means we are good to go to the next step which is our mash out so what i'm going to do now is use my burner and we want to take our mash up to 170 degrees and that will stop all the enzymatic activity i guess enzymatic is a word it is now i got my flame on i'm going to take it up to 170 degrees I'll be back in just a few minutes. All right, folks. Well, now it has come time to do what's known as the Vorloff. And basically what we're going to do is drain some of the wort out of the mash tune here. And we want to get our grain bed set. The grain bed in here is actually going to become a filter to keep particles from going into the uh, brew kettle. So in order to do that, we're going to run some out here into our, our pan and our uh, measuring cup here. Just a little bit, a little fast there. And we want it to run clear. If you can tell, there's like particles of, you know, grain particles and whatnot that is, are in this runoff. But the longer it runs, the clearer it will get. We're also starting to get an indication of what the color of the beer will look like. Now already, I think you can probably tell, it's beginning to run clearer. I think this will be the last of it. I want to try to aerate this as little as possible right now. Here in a little bit, we will be aerating it, but not right now. Now I'm going to move this over to our brew kettle. We're going to begin filling the brew kettle, and here in a moment we're going to begin our sparge as well. I'm supposed to get a total of eight gallons into the kettle. 
Now I am going to begin draining some of our hot liquor out of our cooler into this tank. And basically we want to kind of bring it in about the same speed as what we're taking it out at. And like I say, we're wanting to get a total of eight gallons into our brew kettle. All right, so we'll be back in just a little bit. All right, folks, well, I kind of messed up. I did not figure my sparge water correctly. I needed more than what I had. So what I got to do here, I'm going to take a specific gravity reading here. And I already know what it is. I, I meant to show you before I dumped it back in the kettle. Now, in order to take an accurate reading on this, the daggone tube's got to be level, and it would help if uh, if it would kind of turn for me a little bit here. And right there, it's reading about. If we're reading a little heavy. I'm reading about. I'm reading about 1064. I wanted 1059. I should say 1.064, and I wanted 1.059. So I'm reading a little bit heavy. I think we can make a correction on this as we go through the boil. I can add some uh, fresh water near the end after we see what kind of gravity we're reading at the end. I don't know if you can see that. I'm trying. The daggone thing gets foggy in there real quick. So what we're measuring here is what's known as specific gravity. And you can see the 60 and then you come down two lines. That's uh, 1064 because the one underneath it is 70 and the one above it is 50. So we're reading heavy, which means that it has the potential to make a higher alcohol beer than what we're looking for. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and begin the boil or take, taking it to a boil and we'll be back in a few as soon as we near our boil. Okay, so while we're waiting on our wort to come to a boil, I'm gonna go ahead and get these hops ready to go into the wort. So I've got this bag, it's a hot bag. I'm gonna put my East Kent Goldings in here. Now, and these are rated in bittering power by alpha acid, you see. And this is 5.3% alpha acid. Not terribly high, but high enough to do the work if you use them correctly. We'll get onto that kind of stuff in a further video on down the way. Now, and hops are actually the flower these are actually the flower of the plant that have been put through a hammer mill. And we're going to put these, I got three ounces of the East Kent Goldings that I'm going to put in here. Then near the end of the boil, we'll put in the uh, Fuggles right at the end of the boil. And the purpose of the bag is just to help keep the hops contained. You don't have to use a bag, but it will help it help you keep things cleaner in the kettle. I'm just going to kind of tie that off a little bit right there. Not tight. It doesn't have to be tight. Just so the water can flow through there. Or, or wort. So the wort can flow through there. Okay. So we are still waiting on us on our stuff to come to a boil. And we've got a ways to go yet. That's reading about, not quite, about 158. So we've got a ways to come around, down to around this area to, to before we're boiling. Now, I have not mentioned it yet, but this guy right here is what's known as a coaxial wort chiller. And the way it works is, is a tube within a tube. And the wort we're going to take out from the kettle, I'll have that hooked here, and it will be running on the inner tube of this hose. And then I'll have my garden hose hooked up here, and we'll be running cold water in reverse, while this is while this is running downhill, the cold water will be running uphill, and then it's going to go over there into my flower bed, and then uh, that is going to take us from boiling down to about 70 degrees, real quick, which is what we want. We want to go through the uh, we want to take it down as quickly as possible, because not only do yeast like wort, a bunch of other critters like wort too. And uh, so the purpose is we're going to take it down, cool it really quick. Then we'll take it inside and we're going to aerate it with a pump. 
the wort in the in the fermenter here. The fermenter is sitting right down there, and it's made out of glass, and it is what's known as a carboy. And uh, we will take it in there, and we will use a fish pump, and we will aerate it, and then we will inoculate it with a overdose kind of of yeast. And the purpose is we want to make it so nothing else can compete with how many yeast is in in the wort. Even if we do get a little bit of a infection in there, the amount of yeast we're putting in there should make it so that they, they can't compete for the resources. All right, so we are very close to coming to a boil now. And we begin to get this foam on the top. It's known as what's known as hot break. And we can skim as much of that off of there as we can. Now, and I'm also going to go ahead and put my bittering hops in here very shortly. We don't have to get an OCD on this, but if you pull it out, it'll help the flavor. Okay, so we're gonna put our bag in here. Then I'm gonna kinda tie it off to the side there like that a little bit. I'll be wanting to get it back here in a little while. Now once this comes to a boil, we're gonna boil it for 75 minutes. Now our hops, the early addition, which is as early as it gets, is going to provide our bittering. The later hops, the ones I'm gonna put in at two minutes to the end of the boil, are gonna provide flavoring and aroma to the beer. Now in. You have to be very careful with wort when you're bringing it to a boil. It will attempt to boil over on you if you're not watching things carefully. I'm gonna let that go ahead and float on down in here or fall down in here, however you wanna say it. Looks like our boil is officially beginning about now. For a while, our hops will try to float. Okay, 75 minutes, that's an hour and 15 minutes. So that would put me at about 10 till four actually. Now you see how it's trying to foam up on us here. That's quite common. In fact, I'm gonna take and turn down the heat real quick here. I didn't turn it off. If I wasn't careful, it was gonna come up and over on us. And trust me when I tell you this was basically sugar water and it will make a mess that you don't wanna clean up when it scorches on the outside of your kettle or if you're doing it in the house on the stove, it will make a serious burned on Scorched on sugar mess. Very difficult to clean up. Ask me how I know. Turn it down just a little further. And you can see the green from the hops in here. The bag doesn't totally contain them. That's all right. Now, here in a moment, all this foam will recede and go away on us, or most all of it. Just like that. Kind of odd, isn't it? All right, so there's not much to show you until I go until we get to about two minutes from the end of the boil, at what point I will um, put my other hops into the bag there and we will go from there. All right, folks, so it's about 20 minutes out from the end of the boil. And what I've got here is called a Warflock tablet. And I'm gonna put that into the boil right there like that. And what that's gonna do is help to precipitate out some uh, proteins and stuff like that out of the beer and help for, to make for a clearer beer. And so we'll just let that go. And then we got about 18 minutes or so, and we will be coming back and putting in our final hop addition. Okay, folks, we've come up to this two minutes out. I'm gonna cut the tops off of these hops here. I love the smell of these hops too. Untie the top of this. In goes one. In goes two. Now I'm going to let these boil for two minutes and then I'm going to let them steep for, for 15 minutes. There we go. Our kettle's reading at about six and a half gallons it looks like. It's a lot of boil off, isn't it? Okay, so we're now about two minutes out from beginning to chill our wort here. So I'm going to begin letting water run through the chiller out the hose and we want to get the coldest water possible so i got a, like a 50 foot hose here and then it's got to go through the chiller so we're going to need to need to let the cold water work its way from the ground through the chiller and get it like i said as cold as possible the colder the better got about another minute 
before I pull the hops out of it, if I can find them. I might just let them leave them lay in there because they've sunk to the bottom of the kettle. Okay, we're gonna open this valve. Then I gotta open the valve down here. I'll be adjusting according to the thermometer here. I need to uh, get all my sanitizer out of it first. So I'll just lose a little bit right there. Put that back up here. Now, and it's okay if we, this is where we want to begin to aerate. So if we're splashing as we're going into the carboy, that's just fine. And it looks like we're coming out at about 73 degrees. The cooler, the better. So we're bringing it down from right now, this thermometer is reading 190 to 73 degrees through this chiller. That's pretty efficient. All right, so we will be back in just a little bit. Actually, one more thing that I'd like to do before I turn off the camera is we are going to take another sample here. And it is reading now, it's reading about 70 degrees coming out, which is a lot closer to what the design temperature of the hydrometer is, which is 60 degrees. I am reading right on about 1061 maybe. It's got some bubbles on it and that will affect about 1061, which is a little high. And then it's got a, um, and then there is a correction because this hydrometer is designed to work at 60 degrees. So it may be 1062 or 1.061 or 62, I'm guessing. All right, folks, so that's the end of it. Now, and you see the orange, the orange handle up here on the top of this carboy. That is virtually a necessity when moving around one of these full carboys. I mean, you're talking, um, that's a six and a half gallon carboy and it's probably got five gallons in there at least. And so, you know, five times eight, 40 pounds, plus the carboy itself, talk, talking 45 pounds, gets pretty heavy, especially when you gotta move it about 50 feet in the, into the house and what, to where, where we're headed next. Drain as much of this out as we can. We'll go ahead and put my foil over the top like that. Pull this off the, off the brew kettle. And now I'm going to run a little fresh water through this just to kind of wash out that sugar real quick. Now here in a little bit, I am going to uh, run boiling hot water after I clean the kettle. I'll put about three gallons of hot water in it and I will run three gallons of boiling hot water through the ch uh, chiller here. That way nothing grows on it. Between now and next time I go to brew, there we go. We got a good flow going through there. Now then, we're gonna take this carboy inside. We're gonna aerate it and then we're gonna pitch yeast to it. All right, folks, so you can really begin to see the cold break. Right here, there's a big line where it's falling down to the bottom. Now then, over here in my sanitizing bucket, which is a combination of water and bleach as the sanitizer, you can go expensive or you can go cheap as far as sanitizer is concerned. I prefer the cheap, which is bleach. And two ounces of bleach in five gallons makes a two minute contact time sanitizer. Now I've got a little bitty fish pump here. I'll plug that hose that's been in the sanitizer into it. And then we're gonna come up here and we're gonna drop the other end in here. And then we're gonna find a plug back here. We're gonna make it go. There it goes. So it'll get some air oxygen into it. We need to oxygenate, oxygenate this wort. And so I'll go ahead and put this back on another piece of foil over the top, even though it should be producing enough air that it won't allow anything to enter in. We're gonna let that go for about 20 minutes, maybe half an hour, and we'll come back to it and we'll pitch some yeast to it. Okay, so we've been happily bubbling away for at least a half hour or so in here. And we're gonna go ahead and shut off our pump. Pull out our hose, put that in the sink to be washed in a moment. Over here, I have a yeast starter. And what I did was I took some what's called dry malt extract and I put that, I boiled that, about one cup to three cups, one cup of extract to three cups of water and I used also the filtered water. I did this last night, actually yesterday, about, about 24 hours ago. And already that yeast has fermented out the extract that was in here. And so 
it has pretty well done its job. And this is called a air trap or fermentation trap. And it lets the carbon dioxide out as the yeast is eating the sugar, which it, when it's eating the sugar, it produces two byproducts, carbon dioxide and alcohol. And it will bubble the carbon dioxide out. And so we are going to give this a good shake, mix it up. Basically what it is, it's a yeast baby factory is what this is. Now, and you see the, you can see it bubbling out right now. That's actually carbon dioxide coming out of solution out of this starter. I'm going to just take that out like so. And we are going to pour it directly into our fermenter. Now there is no hops in this. But this is technically beer that I'm pouring in here. Make sure I get all the yeast that are laying on the bottom. We want it all in there. There's actually like some almost chunks going in there. That's all yeast. And we are giving it fresh food to eat. Or them. Actually, there's billions of them. I've got another <clears throat> section of hose here that has been sitting in my sanitizer. This stuff is stiff because it's been cold sanitizer. Now then, what we're going to do is stuff this hose down in the top of this carboy, which it's not an easy fit. It will go because I had it in there yesterday, but there it goes. Now we're going to put this over into a pan here and hopefully or possibly who knows what I'll put it in. I'm going to put it in something that will stay down in here. But at any rate, we are basically making our own airlock here. The pan has water in it. And what this is for, sometimes real vigorous fermentations will actually blow off and out the top, which is quite fine because all that stuff you don't really want or need in your fermentation. I know what I'm going to do. I have a plan. Clamps are beautiful things. There we go. Set it out there far enough that it can handle the bend. Now we'll come back and we'll check on this in about an hour. I think you're going to see quite a difference going on in no more than an hour. So right now I will check my time and we'll be back in about an hour while I clean this up. By the way, I have already got everything outside cleaned up. All I got to do is take more, one more wipe through the boil kettle with a grubby and everything can come inside. Actually, most all of it's already inside and clean, except for the boil kettle. <laughs> we'll be back. All right, folks. So if you look down in the pot here, you will see that it's already beginning to produce carbon dioxide. I should say they, because there's billions of yeast living in this fermenter right now. And every now and again, it'll bubble out a it's about to go. There you go. Now we'll look at, take a look in here and you see the foam that's starting to be created on top of the work. Actually, it is, it is becoming beer now because it is beginning to ferment. And so there we go. Here in another four hours or so, it won't surprise me if I don't have foam coming up and out of the tube. And uh, if it doesn't, that's fine too. We'll, we'll deal with it. But it won't surprise me at all. In the meantime, what I'm going to do now, it's going to take about six weeks for this beer to A, ferment for three weeks, and then it's going to be bottle conditioned for three weeks, meaning that we'll add a little bit more sugar to it or dry malt extract. And we are going to bottle it and get a little bit of carbonation into the bottle through the yeast. And that's how you bottle condition beer. And so this is where we're at for now. All right, folks. So it's been about, oh, 14, 
maybe 16 hours. No, not that long. About 14 hours, I'm guessing, since I started the fermentation. Now, it is really going to town right now, as you can see. And if you look here, you'll see why I've put this blow off tube on rather than going to the airlock fermentation lock whatever you want to call it and you see where all this stuff has been blown up out of the fermenter here in a second let me get it turned on here now I'm, hopefully you can see this inside here but all of our cold break that was in the bottom a lot of it has gotten put into suspension because of the active yeast yeast going on inside here you can see it floating around so it's really going to town right now this is the most active time in the fermenter and yeah it collects some stuff on the inside of the top of the fermenter too as well as in the the blow off tube there quite normal and it'll go it'll keep going like this probably for about the next 24 hours or so and then it'll begin to subside down so we've got a long way to go yet as far as the fermentation is concerned but i just wanted to show you what an active fermentation looks like all right folks so my next step like i told you i'm going to wrap a towel around this or put a t-shirt over it a dark colored t-shirt and the reason being is because you don't want light getting to it so we want to keep it in a dark place and we're going to let it ferment out i may do a two-stage fermentation which is where i will rack the beer out of this fermenter into another fermenter to leave behind this cold break or through whatever you want to call it and so we're gonna let it go in the next probably about four, 48 or 36 to 48 hours then i'll put up putting a a regular airlock on the top of this so there we go folks that is basically how we're going to make beer now i will make some follow-up videos go into fermentation video and then a bottling video this is going to take six weeks of time before we get there folks i hope you enjoyed what you're seeing if you like what you're seeing down here in the bottom right hand corner hit like and subscribe and stay tuned there's always more to come